I go in English. Okay. All, right. All right, I got it. Thanks. Bye. Using, uh, camera equipment is to illustrate that everything that has a body has a life. And in order to illustrate that, I always wanted the individual who I was photographing, whether it was a dog, a praying mantis, or, or, or you know, whatever, uh, to look into the camera. You hear me OK? OK. Um, yes. You know, the praying mantises didn't always want to look. And sometimes you know, it was a challenge. But eventually, I developed a technique for what I thought doing that. And so down the road, I always, always wanted to photograph what I call old women. <laughs> I call us old women. I can do that. I'm 84, so hey, I, can say, I think I can say that. Because I thought, as, as women, we do not like our photo taken. We just don't like it. But I thought, if you're really old, you'll say, oh, well, why not? And it's not really true, but I tried that. Um, I was able to photograph uh, at the Sarah community 90 year old nuns at one point, and they all were willing to look in the camera. They said, I'm 90, it's okay. Uh, by the way, one, one woman was 100, and I got ready to take her picture. She said, I don't think my chin looks quite right. <laughs> so that was candy for me because they were all willing to look, and the <laughs> issue is when we look into the eyes of somebody older, we see more. This we see, necessarily we, we can record it, but we see they remember when somebody had a lawnmower which you pushed. They remember when kids did chores, they mowed lawns, you had to do laundry, you had to miss it, all that stuff. And I, I wanted to be able to illustrate that. So, so what happened here was um, a picture of me showed up. That's me back there with the red dress showed up on, on uh, Facebook. And I put my stuff on Facebook. And, and Susie Farron uh, made a comment. And anybody who makes a comment to me on Facebook, they're, I love them, you're my friend. So I contacted her and we had coffee and uh, she, I said, you know, it turned out she knew my brother. She had interviewed my brother in New York. And I said, you know, I really, really want to photograph all women, but I don't smooth properly because I'm a transplanted New Yorker. And I don't know all you know, the St. Louis schmoozing techniques. <laughs> and she said, I'm a gourmet schmoozer. She didn't really say it that way, but pretty much. And she said, you know, I know a bunch of women and I think it'd be fun. and." She just set it in motion, and we, I photographed them right here uh, in, the, in the back there with the light on them. And um, of course, I practiced for several days ahead of time because I wanted to get the look. Uh, and then more women showed up, and then we got the show. Okay, so you might have a question about how did you do it? So, in answer, so this answer I developed for anyone who has equipment that you want to take a picture with, your cell phone, your whatever, cell phone, most people use cell phones. It's all about the angle, 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 angle. Okay. When we look in all magazines, we, let's see, I'm not saying this quite right. The individual needs to be looking down at us just a tinge. So they're staring at us. And that's what you see in all these pictures. Um, and any I photograph a bird, the bird has to be, I ask the bird, could you just look down a little bit? You know, whatever I have to do to get the look. So I'm hoping if you just, it's, it's like real estate people, it's all about location. In photographing, it's all about the angle. Okay. Uh, Marion and I have been good friends uh, for a little over 10 years now. And she was my first new friend when I reinvented myself uh, and moved to the Central West End. 
And appropriately, I met her at the Schlafly Blanche Library where she had one of her many books. She has now published 80 books. I think so, at least. At that point, she was up to 10 or 20. Uh, I was living in a building that only AT&T could give Wi-Fi to, and it was late. And I was a reporter on a deadline, and so I was at the library to use their Wi-Fi. And there was Marion uh, bringing her latest book about animals to someone at the library who, in another life, I used to work with the St. Louis Globe Democrat. And I, listening to Marion, I said, I think you'd be a good story. You remember it a little differently. She remembers approaching me, but I think I approached her anyway. Marian not only became a friend, good friend, um, but I've also written a number of stories on her over the years for various publications because she bloomed in different careers, but really from what I know, came into her own as a photographer which was a latter day pursuit that she set out to master and by God she did. So she, before this all happened, was talking to me on the phone as we do uh, and said, I'm gonna be photographing all these women. And I said, whoa, wait a minute. You can't photograph them. This is a repository of wisdom that's gonna be walking through the door. Uh, I wonder if I could interview them five minutes, whatever. I, I would really like to see what they have to say because they're a captive audience for those moments. And so I then called Susie, uh, who is under my picture. And Susie's background is that she was a writer and author, did many things in the world of hospital communications um, until she was 65 and then did this reinvention, and as she tells you in her quote on the wall, in the field of writing, as those of us who have been in it, are in it, want to get in it, want to get out of it in some cases. <laughs> no, it's all about the precise word. And as Susie shared when I interviewed her, she feels like her art is intuitive. She can close her eyes and put a stitch or a mark down. And so it's a completely different side of the brain. And Susie, in fact, uh, if I remember correctly, is in Bloomington today or Champaign. She has yet another art show opening. So she has been, she not only to excel in her first career, but to excel in her second. And I introduced myself to her over the phone and said, hey, how about I interview the women? And she said, great. I mean, we're all very open to suggestion. Uh, so I came and as Marion said, women lined up and they were primarily, the initial group was friends of Susie's who were primarily artists or women in the arts. And if you look around, well, you definitely, if you've spent any time at the Guild, you definitely know Catherine Nahorsky who's up there in the center section and others, or artists of various sorts or with museums or accomplished volunteers. One woman, we had some spare moment, had just wandered into the guild that day. And she looked to be of an appropriate age. Everyone at the time of their photos was 63 to 105. This is two years later now. So the 63 year old is 65. Sadly, the 105 year old passed away several weeks after her photo, which wasn't totally unexpected. And fittingly, her quote in the book is, when I asked her, what surprises you about being our age? And I am 72 now. She said that I'm still breathing. So that, that was definitely an apt sign off. And Susie and Marion and I, and you may know Anna Lum, who is someplace farther. Oh yes, right by Cheryl there in the blue. We were the four primary team members and we brainstormed. So like, what kind of a question do you ask to elicit the answer? And it's kind of like, what do you say to the Wizard of Oz? How do you, how do you get this final wisdom? And to digress a moment, I in fact asked this question of 
the two sons of one of my sadly former classmates across the street at Lifelong Learning this week. And this was Rosalind Borg, whom we all in our New Yorker class, which some say is a cult because we meet year round, we treasured Rosalind. And one of her sons is a poet who in fact has had three poems published in the New Yorker, one as recently as last week. So we had a kind of a memorial service online because it was shocking to us that our classmate Rosalind within 48 days of diagnosis was gone. But I said to them, so did your mom, who knowing her would have passed along wisdom at all points of their lives, did she have anything very special to say to you at the end? And one said, well, my son was there and my brother and the grandson wanting to please his grandmother saying, grandma, grandma, is there anything I can do for you? Anything I can do to make you happier? And she at this point was in the throes of lung cancer, was getting hospice at home, was sitting on the edge of her bed, though loquacious was beyond talking much, had her head down, very quiet, and finally said in, in response to her grandson, you could vacuum my carpet it's dirty. <laughs> and so you never know what is going to come out at these special moments, but that showed a certain awareness. So the question we came up with, as I may have said earlier, was what surprises you about being this age? And anyone who has interviewed people, and I take it that many of you have and maybe been on the other side too, it's not so much the question, it's the listening. It's the curiosity, it's the pregnant pause. Uh, my new favorite show is In Treatment. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. It streams, it was an Israeli show. Uh, it was very successful there and it was on, there were three American seasons and it was 10 years ago and that is still available. I know one of the sources and it's a therapist in her office and she works from home and then they let it go for 10 years and now there's a new season with Uzu Adobo who if you're a friend a, a fan of Orange is the New Black about the the prison drama that was based on a memoir anyway the character who played crazy eyes is now the site is now the site is the therapist and I listened to it as recently as 2 a.m this morning um, and it's available on HBO Max and Hulu, and you can pay for it on Amazon, but $2.99 an episode is kind of expensive. But anyway, I listened to it to see how she questions people. How does she get people to open up? How does she get people to open up about things in their lives? She is very good at using the pause she is very good at listening. And then she might say, seems like, sounds like, boy, you've suddenly closed up. I wanted to use all those things, but I was secondary to Marion's schedule. And she had people, and she calls them her 45 second portraits, which really she spent days preparing far before. But I would interview them either before their photo, after their photo. I had five minutes, I had 45 minutes. It just all depended. Um, and when I asked that question and the women in this case, which we usually don't do in an interview, were even given the question beforehand. And again, it's as flip or profound a question as you wanna make it. And it's a moment in time. And it was, I think if we interviewed those same women today, they'd probably say something different. And in fact, uh, most didn't remember what they said at the time, because who would? You know, who knows what you said three days ago? Um, I taped them, which uh, I, I think is pretty much the trend these days for people who report. When I started reporting, it was always a notebook and a pen. And I didn't start taping until I did uh, Q and A's, which I wanted to have the 
precise word, not just quoted word. Also, I did a lot in medicine and was a medical reporter and then also wrote the quarterly magazine for Cardinal Glennon, which was a pretty amazing experience. And in that case, I had to have the doctors on, on tape. There was just no way to retain 14 interviews over the course of a day on seven different topics, but it really helped me to have them on tape. And, oh, I'm sorry, go yes. ahead. Susan, your so turn. I wanted to tell, yes. tell the folks you, you know, you're a, a, gu a guru interviewer <clears throat> and have more that. words. When it came to producing the book, you were limited to 77 words. Anybody get that? So each thing was 77 words. There's, there's, <laughs> there's, to fit the parameters of the page of the book and have it look dramatic, which the book does, um, because of this, the words had to be on this side of the book. You know, you've done all that. Um, so uh, that's okay, that's all I have to say about that. Yeah. That's like, um, wow. So Marion, when you took the photo and for the women in those 45 seconds, how many photos did you snap? Was it sometimes just one? And how did you know which one? Okay, this was huge, 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 huge fun for me. Oh, I should tell you this. See, today I look really gorgeous. Oh, my, my daughters dressed me up <laughs> and said, you should wear this and it looks good. No, mom, you can't put that with that. Okay, so I learned, I wear this. But I'm mostly, I'm not like that. I have, a, you know, a t-shirt of some sort and um, pants. I had to take my shoes off because I want to feel the, I'm very atmosphere oriented, feel the atmosphere of the building, the atmosphere of the person. I do it better without shoes. So, and then there's just me. And I look like that. Um, I did not want to, I, I photographed for the St. Louis Review, I photographed the Archbishop for a long time, uh, and other sort of, uh, quote, important people. And it's important to me not to know how rich or famous or anything you are, because I can't get the image I want, because the image I want is that, well, we all want that, you know, like, oh, really? That kind of thing. So I didn't want to know who these people were. And they sort of knew who I was because Susie said, well, Marion's going to take your picture. And they didn't know me, which is awesome. So um, what, what I wanted to do for you, if you took your picture, was to have a quick fun next. So with, without lighting and without all that serious stuff, you know what I mean? Um, it's just informal and there's just me. And they didn't know how good I was, of course, which was great for me. So I'm, I'm standing there and you're, I said, no, it's your, your turn. Uh, I just want you to look in the camera and I'll take a picture. They said, okay. <laughs> and some of them, some of the pictures here are for me priceless because they thought, who the hell are you? You know, I'm somebody, I'm paraphrasing. I'm really somebody and I don't know you and you're dressed like that, what the hell? And they look and I got it. I got some of the pictures which I viewed as, as um, patronizing, um, snobbish and I loved it because, well anyway, the reason I love these pictures so much is because when you, we, I don't have the right words exactly, when we see each other and we don't know each other and we're walking around and we see somebody, that's what we see. Um, and we, we've been walking right by. This is the kind of thing we would tend to see. Well, I don't know, it's, I call it a genu more genuine look. They're not, looking. so I would take a picture and I have to get down a little low because they have to be looking into the camera, down because that's the, that's the angle I needed. So I was scooting down just a little so they're looking in there. And uh, they looked and I took the picture. So I was telling you, 
I had the aperture, I had the ISO set at about a thousand of a second. Speed was somewhere between 160 and 250th. I had no extra lighting. The lighting was from uh, the lights up there. And the aperture was um, F8, F11, something like that. I took the picture, I said, perfect, or maybe just do one, I took another one. Sometimes I took three, but mostly I just took two. I said, great, you're next, next. And I said, what, what? <laughs> I love that. Um, I'm a transplanted New Yorker and I have a subliminal sort of feeling about what I do. So I, I say, so you're looking at this face here, it's old and wrinkly, I love that. And it's what I call the best disguise I ever had. Because I can look like that and it's like nothing because I'm one of those old, old, old white women. Who the hell? And I can pull it out, like all of us, I can pull it out when I need to. Like who the hell do you think I am, really? Uh, I don't have to usually. Okay, I think that's it. How many in the audience have had the experience of writing to a word count? I, I think anyone who's ever written. Yeah, so 77 was kind of an arbitrary number, but our book was laid out largely, <clears throat> excuse me, by Anna and a designer. And Anna, again, is in the royal blue right over there. And Anna is a one-time computer programmer who is a good Chinese daughter and father said, go into science and math. And she never questioned it and did. And then at some point pulled away and almost 50 years ago, she began playing Tai Chi. She actually learned it in the States. And she, that was the first thing I noticed when I, you know, I said, so what are you doing? And she said, I play Tai Chi. And I said, but I knew that she taught and I now take her classes online, which are great fun. And she said that playing is actually much closer to the Chinese translation than teaching. And I thought that says a world about this woman. So it was those kinds of things. So Anna in her new career uh, is a poet. And, and recently published, and it might be here, she has a, a retrospective of her whole career. And it's beautifully laid out in book farm, and it's called Even the Celery Flies. So there's an insight into Anna, along with playing Tai Chi. So she was the one who said, she wanted to lay out the words like poetry. And this was the beauty of our working in a group. Um, some of the women blew me away with what they said. As we all know, you have a conversation and five years later, for some reason it comes back to you and you think, like one woman in the exhibit, Pat Owick, is a nationally known quilter. She's been part of that dairy barn show many times that travels the United States. And I don't know that it's ever been at the Guild, but it has most recently been at the Foundry in St. Charles. And I had interviewed Pat earlier in her career and mine, uh, and she had shown me something that she had, she does photo transfers and images on quilts. And her father, uh, unfortunately, had Alzheimer's. He has since passed away. And she had taken him on the country roads, I believe in Kansas, where they had grown up. And he looked at a farm and he said, F-A-R-M, um, somebody used to live there. And I thought, wow, somebody used to live here. Somebody used to live there. He's acknowledging what took place in that dwelling. And maybe somebody's there now, but it wasn't the somebody that he remembered. But it said so much. Pat, on this uh, interview said how much she appreciates her women friends, no offense to men. And I must mention that Marianne and I hope our next project will be interviewing quote, older men. Uh, but, but Pat Oleg this time talked about 
the value of her, her friendships with other women, that they had gone through the usual things together, dating, marriages, babies. Uh, I did get marriages in there. Uh, you know, divorces, grandchildren, the whole thing. But she also found that there were certain things that happened within the woman's system that she could discuss with her friends, that they went through those things together, that you didn't have to give them a Google entry if you wanted to talk about a particular lining of a particular organ, that it was all there. Another woman said, and this was, although they knew the questions, pretty spontaneous. She said, and this was Jane Olson Glidden. She said, my hands, my hands are my mother's. Our knuckles are the same. And I think we all have that feeling, kind of like looking in the mirror and seeing your mom, hearing your mom when you're disciplining your children, whether she was talking about arthritic knuckles or others, she saw her mom. Um, somebody else talked about, and again, these are just sort of spur of the moment, maybe three minute, five minute, maybe more, said that she was aware of a lot of synchronicity, like she said, and this happened to me this morning. You're thinking about something and you hear something on the radio and it is the answer that you're looking for, or it's the topic you want. And it sounds goofy to say it. And this woman used the example of queen bees. And this morning I was trying to think of, to pick a movie for a movie group that some of you are part of, that's been meeting almost 20 years. And I heard a great interview with a movie that's gonna be available and it's called Swan Song. And I thought, ooh, had I known I would have turned in at this exact moment, but it worked. Someone else said, um, I wish I'd taken better care of myself. She had been diagnosed with thyroid cancer and said, I wish I could take my 40 year old self and say, watch your nutrition, do what you can um, so that you won't face this later on. But she's now swimming, doing all kinds of things. And she also referenced her art and said, art helped me take some of my hurt, my grief, and put it on paper. So, wow, would she say that today? I have no idea, but she said it then. Someone else who always worked with kids said, now that I'm retired, I'm following the same advice I gave them. Everybody should quote, sing every day, draw every day, write every day, look at the night sky, and not step on bugs. And it just makes me laugh every time I think about it, but there's a lot behind it. So I had the privilege of living with these women through their quotes. Uh, one woman said, um, I am first living my authentic self. She had come to St. Louis a number of years ago to be treated for an eating disorder. She was at the same time recovering from the dissolution of a multi-decade marriage. And she got in touch with herself and said, whereas most people at our age think that most of their life is behind them, I know that the best of my life is ahead of me. And she was at the reception and I heard someone walk up to her and say, and they had read the book, you changed my life. I really needed to hear that after a lifetime of addiction, you had found peace and calm. So I think, I think the whole package works together. Are you proud of the show? Is that a silly question? <laughs> How proud are you of the show? I, I don't know, it doesn't exactly relate to me. Marion and I have did another show together that was at a gallery and it was on people and their pets. Cats. Yes, the pet was a cat. And I interviewed everyone, but somehow didn't have time to get the quotes down. So I regretted on that because we got great quotes, things like a male saying, I have had a better and longer lasting relationship with my cat 
than any of the women who've ever been in my life. <laughs> and he meant it. Did, did you feel emotional? You made friendships as I did mm -hmm. based on this. Did this show hit you in a different way or was it like photographing a bonobo? Marion has followed a particular bonobo ape. It is a species of ape from babyhood to adolescence adulthood, going to a sanctuary in the Parisian countryside. And Lucy, this particular bonobo, had a baby. And of course, Marion wasn't there for the birth, but she was there afterwards. And one of Marion's photo of Lucy and baby ended up on a billboard in the French countryside. Do you feel as emotional about the women or are they just, are they, among your many subjects? Uh, that's a very good question. And um, um, so I don't even know what to say about this. I, I found uh, somehow that I have a little, you can hear by, by what I'm saying and how I look, I, I view myself as a little bit naive in a lot of ways. I'm extremely focused on what I'm doing. Um, ex extremely. I, I published all these books, like 70 or 80 books on my animals because I thought it would look good on my resume. <laughs> Nobody buys them. Well, sometimes they buy them. Um, so in answer to your question, uh, I am so directed at what I seem to want to be doing that all the other questions around me are basically irrelevant. I wanted to photograph old women faces. That's what I wanted. That's what I did. The rest of it is okay. So I, I don't answer the normal questions. Susan is a gourmet discussing things, has all those words <laughs> she can use. Um, I don't want them. I mean, I don't use, know them. Um, so I, am t I also want to add one thing. I, I photographed, um, I want respect for the individual. It's a big, big, big deal for me. That's what I want. And in photographing animals, I wanted them looking in the camera. I produced a project, took me about 10 years, to photograph animals who were willing to line up for their family picture. They had to be willing, dogs, sheep, cows. Um, and I got them all I, over time. It took me eight years to find sheep who were willing to look into the camera, but I did it. <clears throat> and the, the deal is this, if you have, if, if, when you go home, you can line up some pretzels on your kitchen cabinet, okay? Line up three pretzels, and then you line up five or six pretzels, because pr you can always find pretzels, because they're similar, they have to be similar. When we look at something that's three, three dogs, three whatever, we say, oh, that's nice. When we look at five or six, our brain says there's a fraction of a second longer looking at each individual in that group. And I knew that. Well, you probably have thought about that, but you haven't noticed it. Um, so, okay, so in answer, I, I knew that when we had an overwhelming group of women, in this case, the atmosphere in the room, the impression of the feeling of what we're looking at is significantly different, overwhelmingly different than we see three women looking at the camera. And I don't know any other words to describe it. You can see yourself, you look at that and think, what's going on with all those women? <laughs> is that answering your question? Yeah. Um, and I think it's our different way of viewing things that is very complementary with ease. Um, this was also a chance with the quotes. You know, if you've ever worked for a publication and, and you have to be technically grammatical, you have to, uh, at least in, in the days at the newspaper, change grammar so that it is correct, all kinds of things is probably less widely done today. I, I wanted to share a quote with you from Gong Shu, who is the woman in the sunglasses over to your right. She is now 88. 
And I loved, I, I think her attitude speaks volumes. She said, I never planned. I taught Chinese painting. If one drop of water falls on paper, you follow it, be in the moment. Students said their insomnia and depression were cured. Then people say, have you heard of art therapy? I study, become an art therapist. I tell students, experience your paintings, feel what's going on with your body. They feel better. Somebody says, you are a psychodramatist. I say, what psychodrama? Since 1993, I train people worldwide to express emotions in art and dance. And as it turned out at our opening last Friday, um, Gong Shu was not going to be able to come because she had a student in China that she was teaching on Zoom, but somehow the class fell through. So she was able to be here and she didn't remember what she said as most people wouldn't. And when I read it to her, she said, that's true. <laughs> so I, you know, I guess as a, as a writer, that's the best thing that can be said to you is that's true. Um, speaking of definitions of writer, I had a, a lengthy and meaningful conversation this week with uh, a dear friend's goddaughter who just got her MSW. And she, um, after asking me about interviewing techniques, which I then asked her because she, one of her things is that she works the suicide hotline, talk about knowing how to elicit information and say something reassuring. And she said to me at some point in the interview, are you a journalist? And I thought, well, yeah. And I said, we used to call a journalist an out of work reporter because you didn't know what to call yourself. But I said, I bet it's something different to you. And she said, yeah, a journalist is one who journals. And I said, then I'm not a journalist. But learning from each other and that curiosity is number one factor in Cheryl's books, in Bonnie's books, in Jane's work with Gloria Steinem, in, in Deb's book on chocolate. Just let your curiosity be your guide. Janice, did you want to take questions or? So we will open it up to questions here. As you can see, I think we have two people who certainly respect their subjects, who experience their experiences, and uh, just a couple questions along the way. Susan, how long was the longest interview that you thinned down to 77 words? You know, it was probably about 45 minutes, but that was my fault, my blessing. You know, the woman happened to have a long time to talk, but you've cut down interview. It's the challenge, it's the puzzle, it's the fun. If it's good at 150, boy, get it down to 50. I mean, sometimes it goes too far. Cheryl and I met each other when we were both working at the St. Louis Sun. And oh my God, we were doing practice newspapers and they whacked our stories down in the practice edition to 50 words it felt like on some of them. So you didn't even get your lead in. That, that was excruciating, but I think it's often for the better that they come down in size. Mary, do you know someone online who appreciated your comments about uh, the angle of taking pictures? They would also like to know, she would also like to know how, as a subject, you set yourself or what's the best situation for being, for having your photo taken? Let's see, I'm not quite sure what her question is. I think it has to do so you present your best self, so that you present your best self to the camera. Any suggestions for that? Or do you ask your subjects perhaps to do a certain thing? Okay, let me see if I understand the question. If the question is, if you're the subject and I'm taking your picture, what is the best way that you can present yourself? Okay, very good question. We all, especially 
we want to know what to do with people. And I, um, my answer is not sufficient. Because my answer is, what is the look you want to have? You know, we, what do you want to look like? What's the deal? Why am I here? What, what is the project? Um, so that's, that's not really the answer. She should call me up. Um, you know, we have formal pictures we want to have taken, we, you know, that's, that's, um, yeah, she should email me, how about that? So I think the answer is that it depends on the situation as far as what you're trying to project as well, right, right? along the way. Um, you've all lived essentially with these women, one way or another through this experience. Um, do you, do you find that you continually, not just for the program, but also continue to live with them in your memory? I know as an interviewer, I find myself remembering bits and pieces along the way and it pops up. Um, how about with the photographs? Do you have a, a memory that pops up for some of them along the way that was? Hmm. Oh, thank you. Did somebody ask that question? Me? Oh, you. <laughs> uh, no. Uh -huh. No. Um, I wanted what I wanted at the time. I got it. And, and that's it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it was, for me, it was a wonderful, 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 wonderful life wishing, wishing, wishing event that I got to, to see these, the, what I call the genuine look on all these women, uh, which is almost impossible to get, but individually, no. I don't, I don't remember them particularly. I met somebody in Forest Park one day. I was photographing a 400 pound turtle in Forest Park. Where do you get a 400 pound turtle? I have this huge lens, big 660, 600 prime lens for your photographer over there. And she said, I think I remember you from somewhere. I said, oh, okay. She said, you took my picture. And then, then I remembered her. But other than that, I'm sorry. What about you, Susan? Um, I was the kind of messy reporter editor whose desk was always stacked and I would finish one project, take those things off and go to the next. And so this, this turned out to be a two year project. Not that we worked on it for two years, but the photos because of the pandemic, the photos were the original photos and then there were more groups that came in. We're end of July, so just about this time, 2019 and then living with them while going through the quotes, then I think you tend to shelve it. But for things like this, for things like the opening, you know that feeling of looking at things with fresh eyes, if you're away from your material, whether two months, two years, 20 years, and you get to look at it again, and you forget that you're the one who did it, but you just want to read it as someone who's never seen it before. So that's the way I am with some of these now. But I feel um, a closeness to the women. It was hard recognizing some of them at the, at the exhibit, at the opening, which was a fantastic event, thanks to Zach and Catherine and others. Some had stopped coloring their hair, and instead of blonde, they were gray, as we all would be. Uh, some of them changed their hairdos, and some of them had gone through other changes in their lives. So um, do I think of them when I wake up in the morning? Not necessarily, but do they resonate with me when I hear on the radio the name of the movie that I think I want to see? And she told me she heard about honeybees when she was thinking about honeybees. Sure, it, it's a kind of a repository of wisdom that we were lucky enough to receive. 
Oh, I have uh, one comment. It's, it's important, it seems to be important to me that my work resonates with people I don't know around the world. Uh, that's happened. So when I, do, I should have mentioned this before, when I do a project, I'm thinking that this is going to cause what I call an inadvertent smile on hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people because I'm on Facebook and a lot of people, whatever. Uh, and that's it's crucial to me that I feel as if I have contributed to, to somebody for a half a second and that half a second or maybe a whole second and a half, they're there and not over here where we all are generally. And I have done that. Um, I feel now that I have the ability to do that and I'm doing that. And it was the same thing with this image. This will resonate with a lot of people, especially the women's issue, of course, which we haven't even talked about. Uh, it's a big overwhelming deal for women, even though men are awesome too. I grew three of them myself. I have three boys and three, three girls. Um, so we haven't really talked about the um, impact of, of uh, doing a project like this, which nobody has done before, no one. So it's important for a lot of reasons which we haven't even discussed. Well, I think the residents of the show speaks for itself. And I think it shows in the response that we received this morning with so many people online, as well as the people who are here. Um, I have one quick question for Marion, and that is, it has to do with taking pictures. We all have, I had my grandchildren, granddaughters here last week, I have pictures. So as a result, one of the things that you have for sale on your website is a um, puzzle with photo, a photo of pelicans, which yes. is extraordinary. Um, do you think that things like that are a good way to memorialize some of your photos so that you just don't have them on your phone or whatever? I think that many of us struggle, most of us struggle perhaps, with what to do with the abundance of photos. And I know we all know that you didn't take just this shot when it came to depicting the women who were in the show well, as three, well. Three pictures per person. No more than three pictures per person. Is that what you mean? Yeah. What do you do with the photos? Oh, literally what, an answer is not about the grandchildren thing, but I would suggest when it comes to grandchildren, you get them printed out. We have notebooks that our, grandchild, our grandparents did. We look at those, those children, they're not going to see those later. They're gone. They're on the email. Anyway, uh, your question is, uh, what do I do with pictures? Literally, I had my computer there. When I took the, the three pictures, I had a file with their name on it, the date. I downloaded the pictures into that. Is that what you're asking? OK. Um, every, every day when I've done a, a job, what I have done is I make a disk. If you say, oh no, discs are old fashioned, you can't do that, they're gonna run over. But that's what I've been doing since 2003. Every day I have a disc and it says, somebody called me uh, two months ago and said, said, I have my mom who just died that the Archbishop gave her a Woman of the Year award and um, she died. And I like, wish I had that picture and I called the St. Louis Review and they said, well, Marion Drifter took the picture and it was March 28th, 2012. And she said, I will go mumble, mumble. I went back to my 2012 shoebox and all the months are in there, January, February, March. I went to March, there was March 28th on the back. She had her picture in an hour and a half. Is that what you're asking? <laughs> Um, I just did that because I didn't know what else to do to save my pictures. I understand there's a cloud issue and, and all those things, but anyway, I'm still doing this. So if you say, you photographed my dog in 2012, and I think it was in August, I'm going to have it. Okay. One of our viewers wants to know what it was like to photograph 
your partner over there. And did you have any surprises along the way for both of you? Well, Susan is a delight for me. You know, she gets me, um, and um, so I wanted to photograph Susan looking in the camera like everybody else, but she didn't want to do it that way. She wanted to look beautiful. Uh, and I said, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> so, so yeah, no, well, I didn't have any surprises as far as I know. Um, I guess surprises were, for me, in some ways, the relevancy and Janice addressing your very good question of do you make jigsaw puzzles out of your magazine stories or your, your dragon illustrations? Several of the women who have been artists of long standing said, who wants my work these days? My kids' walls are filled. What am I doing with them? And so one of them was literally cutting up her work and putting it together in different ways. Someone else who is a fine photographer, but said, everybody's got a cell phone. Everybody takes the same sunflowers. Just look on Facebook. She said what she was doing was she was collaging maybe a hundred images together to, to give a, a sense of something in a way that maybe the others couldn't. Uh, somebody else who has been an artist all of her life said she's now doing a kind of blind drawing. And I wish I could watch her do it. She closes her eyes, holds a pencil, has paper underneath, and whatever comes out, comes out. And so many people are challenging themselves with new fields. But yes, there's the realization, realization for all of us. You had a thousand bylines. Say five? I mean, what are you, what are you gonna do with them? So uh, yeah, it's a good question. So maybe we can conclude with the wind up question. You're both grandmothers. You've both been in you've both been in professionals in your field for a very long time. Is that the sort of thing that you would tell your grandchildren as your legacy? Or is there some message? that you would like to say to, let's say, your grandchildren that you want to leave for them? Not necessarily the wall one, but a certain legacy, a certain thing that you wish you would tell them in 77 words or less. Oh, um, I adore my grandchildren, as anyone who knows me knows. I just came back from Portland, Oregon after not seeing them for 19 months. And that meant this was the first time meeting my newest granddaughter, Cece, who is now almost nine months old. I had seen her on screen, but I had never gotten to play with her. Rosie and Fee are my other two granddaughters. And I once interviewed, I didn't mean it to be an interview, but I was getting ready for a trivial pursuit con evening or something. And I, I knew there might be a lot of Disney. And I was asking Rosie and Fiona to tell me all about the Disney princesses. And we were out to dinner. This was pre-pandemic. And I was taking notes. And, and Rosie, at some point in the evening, said, Gaga, which is what they call me. And I am literally Gaga about them. Gaga, enough with the questions, which sounded like something out of my mother's mouth. But then Rosie does interviews. I've seen her do it. So I feel like I passed it along and it was just delightful to see. And she might pick up a napkin, whatever, and pretend it's a microphone. You know, you don't have to have the real thing. And so that has given me great delight. And I would love to interview them at specific phases in life to see what is most important to them then. And I guess I, I do it in a sense, but I'd like to do it even more often. That's great. So my grandchildren are 25 and so older, older grandchildren. And I've always since they've, um, I'm not the typical grandmother person because I want to work or I want to take, do. anyway, the point is I asked them one time and a couple of times and they know the, the um, the products that I have produced, 
um, books, coffee mugs, books, books, books. Um, one's called um, Animals Don't Wear Lipstick. Why Don't Animals Wear Lipstick, which is cute. Uh, significant, well, anyway, I asked them, I, I don't spend as much time with you as many grandparents do. And I'm wondering if the kind of work that I've done and the kind of work I do, the energy that I have for it, is that helpful for you? And I would ask them different, different when they're not together so they don't say yes, yes. <laughs> and the response is, it means basically in my words, it means a whole lot to me as an example that you've been able to do this kind of work as an example for me to know that I can accomplish stuff when I want to, something like that. So I feel like I've done it, done what I needed, but that's the bottom line, of course, is what, what's left for the, for the children. And they'll remember what I've done. So. Thank you so much. I do want to tell everyone that the entire show is available in the book self herself i'm sorry um, and it has all the pictures all the interviews that are that have been used and you can pick that up here at the artists guild anytime or you can find it on amazon but it's available and it will be in your hands immediately when you come to see the show before the end of the month so we would be more than delighted to have you do that we thank of course, Marion and Susan for delighting us this morning. Um, if you contacted us through our mailing list, you will probably be included in future mailings so that you can find out more of our programs if you would like. If you don't want to be bothered or have that happen, that would be fine too. Just let us know. But we think that you may have missed something or would like to double check something that was said. So we also will have it online on the YouTube channel for the Artists Guild, uh, probably later this week, in a week or so, so that you can have it. Uh, the next program that the Missouri Professional Communicators will give is probably the end of September. We're not quite ready to tell you about it yet, but you will certainly hear about it, and we hope that you will enjoy that as well. We host a good, a, a wide assortment of items for communicators as far as uh, attracting people for different interests that they have, and we're delighted that we were able to bring you this presentation. We don't usually do one in the summer, but this was very special because this is when it was up in the gallery. We host an annual contest where the first place entries in the state move up to the national contest in the competition with the National Federation of Presswomen. Um, the Artists Guild is now opening its registration for classes, workshops, you name it, and they will have it this fall for you as well. So be sure to double check its website. Uh, things are offered for children as well as adults. Uh, not only are teachers here to help you with your various aspects of, of drawing and painting, but you connect, can connect with printmaking uh, this, uh, this fall, there will be a, a workshop on art of the art of meditation when you're embroidering fabric collages, which mm. sounds marvelous. And you can even find your voice in poetry this fall. Uh, just be sure to sign up on the Artists Guild website and um, you'll get the newsletter every week. So I think that pretty much concludes our day. Thank you again and again. For Thank you. Your time. I'm not used to that.